Windows chases the control panel, Windows chases the links, and Halo has a pretty good update. Happy Friday, friends. It is Friday. We are back again doing another podcast. Although this is uh, one of the last, well, there's probably a podcast following the week of Christmas, but uh, we are we are in the home stretch of the Christmas season if you haven't gotten stuff you're probably just going to buying the beef jerky from the local gas station and stuffing it in the stockings but uh anyways we are wrapping up december here even though it's only the 17th of the month is pretty much much over for major news but that doesn't mean things weren't announced this week that are quite interesting honestly especially if you're following the world of windows which i do and i, and I love to do so let's just dive in shall we uh first thing up now teams now supports end-to-end -end encryption for one-to-one -one calls so if that's important to you that is now available and just keep in mind that it is one-to-one -one calls and microsoft is trying to I'm assuming they're going to bring this to all calls eventually. Um, just be cognizant if that's really important to you. And I suspect that for a lot of government contracts and clients, that is going to be important. So that is now available, which is a good thing. Uh, Microsoft also announced that Windows Terminal to be the default Windows 11 command line experience. This just this shouldn't come as a surprise to many people, especially as Microsoft has really invested heavily in the Windows subsystem for Linux. And a lot of these terminal-like experiences, now they're just making it the default experience. PowerShell is not going away. Some people were like freaking out when they heard this and all that. Um, it's just Windows Terminal is now becoming the default experience. Not that big of a deal, but just something noteworthy. Uh, Microsoft also released Visual Studio 2022 Mac Preview 4. If that gets your jingle bells excited, um, there you go. Uh, that is now available. So, a uh, couple big, one of the big things that I really want to dive into this week is that the control panel, actually somebody asked about this a couple weeks ago. They said, what's going on with the control panel? And now we finally have some details from Microsoft. So, it looks like Microsoft is once again putting cognizant effort into really deprecating the control panel. I don't think it's going to go away fully for a very long time, but they're now making more features available and pushing more people over into the traditional settings app, which has been around, I believe, since Windows 8. I know it was definitely around since Windows 10 and well they're putting more features into it more like like such as uh things links to programs and features in the control panel will now open in settings and also for uninstall updates cumulative updates and etc will now happen with inside the settings panel this is just one more sl very small step on this slow journey to fully getting rid of control panel and it kind of makes you wonder if microsoft for this year ahead is really going to put more effort into that to kind of finally kind of rid itself of that i don't know but this is step one or it shouldn't even step one this like step 13 of about 50 to getting that process completed so anyways it's just something to be keeping your eye on um also microsoft did some other things that i don't agree with when it comes to edge there was a workaround so that if you were if you were opening an app that required edge browser to open say the widget experience or whatever there were workarounds to have it open in your preferred browser like chrome and so once again they're making it so that you cannot work around these things and there are still some sort of workarounds but the, the thing is to, to understand through this is it's now a cat and mouse game microsoft has officially really driven home the point that if you are clicking a link in say a widget experience or wherever they deem necessary or which is honestly a lot of places um they are going to make sure that you open edge if you another workaround comes out they're going to probably try to squash it this reminds me a lot of what was going on somewhat with ios many years ago we just finally got that experience in ios 14 and this feels like a parallel experience where microsoft is saying when we want you to use edge you're going to use edge and there's no way about it i don't agree with it i believe that if you go into the settings and say i want my preferred app or my preferred browser to be chrome or whatever it should be that for all experiences this is microsoft tries to make some cheap arguments it's like it's a better experience we can control the entire process but you know what let the user make that decision i'm perfectly okay with the default browser in windows 11 being edge that is perfectly fine and acceptable but if i want to change that don't take that control away from me and don't splice up the experience inside of windows because it makes it feel less polished as an os which i it just doesn't feel great and there it's cheap engagement honestly it was just like when they were saying every time you search that was a cortana experience because you were searching but it was kind of cortana like and then they said look how many cortana users we have and we all know how that actually worked out microsoft is just really just trying to force edge into existence and it's a fine browser it doesn't need this this right-handed hook uh, into certain parts of the os that make it convoluted to use um, people should choose Edge, and that should be the experience that Microsoft wants. They should want people choosing Edge, not forcing it upon them. So, anyways, the important takeaway here is Microsoft's going to make it happen one way or another. 
and that's just the way that it is. Uh, an update from last week, Microsoft has fixed a bug that prevented users from calling 911 uh, with an update, and so that is very important. So if that you were potentially impacted by that when you had Teams installed, so just keep that in mind that that has not been imp that has not been fixed, I should say. Uh, and one thing, I don't talk a ton about things I look forward to at CES because most of the time it's just junk or things that won't ship for a long time or it's some TV or whatever. One thing I absolutely am looking forward to at CES this year is that AMD is going to be sharing an update on Zen and RDNA products at CES 2022. Uh, to me, I interpret that probably meaning there's Zen 4 architecture. I'm not expecting them to announce chips, but who knows, maybe they do. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing how AMD, what, what their next volley is in the battle against uh, Intel. We're, we're at a great time. We got the 12th gen stuff. I actually got to play a little bit, very little bit, uh, with an i9, uh, the 12, 12900K. Uh, appears great. I mean, it appears like an awesome machine or an awesome chip. And I look forward to seeing how AMD is going to combat that. And they are known for a lot of cores. And it's exciting. It's exciting that both Intel and AMD are doing great things in the processor market. It just means that there are better upgrades on the horizon. I will tell you, though, that I have multiple experiences with this now, that getting DDR5 memory is is the chokehold. Like, getting an Intel 12900K might be a challenge. I haven't looked at, like, actual stock today. But getting DDR5 memory is the bigger challenge as it seems right now. So be careful when, you, when you're when you specking all that stuff out that that might actually be tough to do. Anyways, uh, on to the gaming news. So, a couple things here. One, I'm not going to do any spoilers, but I'm 99.8% of the way through the Halo Infinite campaign. Really enjoyed it. Now, it's not perfect. There's some things I would love to change and some things I'd tighten up just a little bit. But overall, I would recommend it. Like, it's one of the better Halo Halo campaigns. I have enjoyed it. And the story appears to be quite good. And I, that's all I'm going to say about that. But I'm really excited about the updates that are coming to multiplayer. Now, there's been a lot of talk on multiplayer about how it launched, uh, whatever, a couple weeks ago. And not a great state. Not from a competitive gameplay or a gameplay ex mechanics experience, but from, like, a, you can't play Slayer. So that has been resolved. That has good. There's a playlist update. This is, this is positive reasoning. F this is positive momentum for many different reasons. One, uh, Halo's headed in the right direction it's like hey there was an issue they got it resolved they initially what doesn't really make too much sense is they initially told us like this update was going to take some time which got really bl got massive blowback but now we've got a slayer playlist those things are happening also they're making changes to the rewards for battle pass and in-game events which is also good there's been a ton of talk about the cost of things halo halo infinite microtransactions are are brutal i think is the only way to describe them but at least the in-game events where you can earn gear is being refined and being updated. At least it's a little bit more enjoyable. So at least now we have Slayer and we, we see things are progressing in the right direction. I don't expect microtransactions pricing to change any significantly. Because um, you remember, they invested hundreds of millions of dollars into this. And they got to make money on it. There's probably a big pressure from Microsoft down on 343. It's like, look, you've got this out now. We made the bet of making it free. You've got the campaign out there. Now you really got to find ways to start turning a profit. And that's the reality of a free-to-play multiplayer game such as Halo Infinite Multiplayer. So it's headed in the right direction. I think that's the most important thing. Other things, if you are bored this holiday shopping season, holiday, holiday shopping, that's behind us, but this holiday season, uh, Power On, the new Xbox docu-series is out. I've only watched the first one. They're about, they seem like they're about 40 minutes in length. Really good. Really, like if you're listening to this podcast, you're going to enjoy this. I guarantee it. It very much reminds me of like the book I wrote beneath, uh, beneath the surface. That sort of mentality, if I were to write a book about Xbox, it would be the same style. And it's, so it's the trials and tribulations, and they're pretty candid, at least so far, about some of the, the issues that have gone on, just working through bringing Xbox to market. And so it's wonderful. Also, uh, on Camp Sony this week, they also announced new PS5 console covers and controllers, and these will be coming, I believe, next month. It's just, we all saw this coming, especially if the thing that I wanted to point out was that there were third parties doing this. Like Dbrand was in on this, and they crushed those guys. And they said, we're going to do it ourselves, and you can't do it. Fair game. It's Sony's hardware. But it always feels bad when they kind of crush the little guy. So, anyways, uh, not a ton else going on this week. There are a bunch of questions, though, which are always my favorite part. So, let's just dive in. JNBCK says, happy Friday, Brad. And, well, happy Friday back to you. He says, I am getting Game Pass for my son, uh, who is 12 for Christmas. When I sign up, would I be better off getting my own email for this account or using his? I can access both accounts, but didn't know if he would have... 
Ooh, if he would have to be on my PC account while playing, if you used my email. He has his own Microsoft account to log into the PC, just looking for the smoothest path. So considering he's 12, considering he has his own MSA, I personally would go that route. Not because, like if you want to be super over the shoulder about it, then maybe your own. But I would personally use their MSA as a, and make sure they're added to your family in the Microsoft account. The reason being, the reason why I being, I, I say this is I would expect your son to use this account for the long term. Like they may not realize it, but this is going to be their email for a long time. And they're going to use it to sign up for Xbox live or game pass when, you know, they're long and gone and out of the house. And that way, by using this account, you have, they, they, I should say, have one linear path from all their gaming and purchasing experiences. If you have different email accounts, then at some point they're going to have to switch. And that's probably going to be more annoying than you really want it to be. So my recommendation would be to use his own, but just make sure they're added to your Microsoft family account so that you have uh, optics into what is going on there. You probably already do considering um, based on some of the, e how you wrote this. Um, he says, I don't know if there'd be any uh, limitations since he's under 13. I believe the only limitations you're going to run into can be overridden by the adult on the account. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, da, 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 da. So Matthew, oh, Matthew says, is it possible for Xbox to acquire Japanese publishers like Sega, Bandai Namco, or Konami? Technically, it is possible, but it is much harder for them to acquire a company out of Japan. Uh, just through regulatory means, it's it's there's more barriers in place for that to happen because it's easier for somebody like Sony to acquire uh, like Bandai Namco or something like that because it's a, it's you know it's in the same country. So, it's not that it can't happen, it's just that there's more regulatory hurdles and there's a, a big process you have to go through to be able to do that as an outsider to purchase any Japanese company. It doesn't necessarily mean um, just like if Ford wanted to buy Toyota as an example, they would be going through the same thing because it's a US company trying to buy a Japanese company. Uh, is it true about a Minecraft platform fighting game? So I haven't heard a Minecraft platform fighting game, but I have heard that Microsoft is exploring how to use their, their wide, their wide range of IP for new gameplay experiences. And I believe, I, I know that the concept of like a Smash Bros has been tossed around internally at Microsoft. I don't quite know when or where that will materialize, but they now have enough IP across all of their all of their studios to create that style of a game. And Minecraft might be a unique place to do that because you got to think, how do we not you can't out Smash Bros Smash Bros like that that doesn't happen anymore. They're sort of like you got to have a different style of experience. And maybe potentially on Minecraft might be quite interesting. So. Uh, when will we have a new Killer Instinct? I do not know when we will have that. That's, that is, that is a tough one. Uh, Migi, Migi says, I just saw the Xbox documentary. I was thinking that the whole thing is amazing. And I particularly love the part where they talked about the proposal to buy Nintendo. Yes, that, that is true. And the one where they talked about how they rejected GTA 3 being Xbox exclusive. What's your favorite part? My favorite part is that it exists. First off, I'm not all the way through it, so I can't point to a particular part. Um, but honestly, the fact that Microsoft is willing to do this and talk about the highs and lows. They talk about the red ring of death. They talk about the Xbox One. They talk about TV, TV, TV. Um, I know all these things because I've seen highlights of it. But uh, I, the fact that it exists and Microsoft was willing to do this on the record and from a first party perspective, I, that is probably it, uh, my favorite part. Ingor Max says, uh, maybe this one is outside of your knowledge, but playing Halo Infinite, I sometimes see that I would like to buy, but the prices are just way too much, although they line up well with other games. Uh, is there a particular reason why microtransactions are priced that way? Because you would think more people will be buying items if they were just a bit cheaper and they would make more money in the long run instead of charge of $15 for a sword. So here's where we are at in the life cycle of Halo Infinite microtransactions. This is an economy question. This is demand and elasticity of pricing. This is an economics theory and is something that I love. Um, so first off, one thing they can do is they can look at comparable titles and say, okay, what are skins going for in other titles? What is, you know, what is the norm over on X platform, Apex Legends, Fortnite, whatever. Okay, what is that pricing? Well, what are we, what sort of value are we providing on the Halo side? Is it comparable? Can they be comparable? Maybe it's a bit more and I, that's sort of the feeling and that it's 
it's a little bit more nuanced than say other platforms. But what Microsoft, I guarantee is gonna be doing is looking at the price elasticity. We will be seeing sales. We'll be seeing things come, I guarantee, at different price points along the way. And they will find out where the actual price inflection occurs so that they can get maximum amount out of value without lowering the price too much. You gotta remember, it's always easier to lower price than it is to raise it in the world of sales. So uh, they can come out at a higher price point and if they cut it down a little bit, then the perceived value increases for the user and more people will buy it. Microsoft, I guarantee, is studying the data of transactions exceptionally close because they will be tweaking the model and how things operate, trying to get, to your point, the maximum amount. Now, if they lower, let's just say a sword skin or, or a helmet for that matter, let's just say it's $10. If they know that they can make $1,000 on it at the $10 price point or or I don't know, $2,000 at an $8 price point, well, obviously they will lower that price to that point. But there's definitely a diminishing return because what if they go to uh, $5 and they only make $2,200? Well, then that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yes, it's $200 more, but they'd rather have the perceived value higher and the pricing higher so that they can, again, cut sales and do more things later down the road. It's a, it's a really big... I, I would love to have this data and see how Microsoft is going to be looking at trying out different price points for different products until it will have, I would be surprised if they don't ever adjust them in, in one way or another, either through bundling, which would then it lower the potential cost because it's like, hey, I'm getting a helmet and a, a boot or whatever for the same price. Well, then now I'll buy it because then Microsoft just got you to spend $20 either way instead of potentially 30 it, this is a fun process. Just be on the lookout for Microsoft making adjustments to the model. I don't have any insight currently whether or not they are going to lower prices. But the reality is Microsoft spent hundreds of millions of dollars on Halo Infinite and they have to recuperate it either through Xbox Game Pass, but even that's not a direct one-to-one -one relationship because people may have put uh, Forza Horizon 5 in there and then they put Halo Infinite. So Halo Infinite's contribution to growing Game Pass isn't as significant as, as it was a standalone title, if that makes sense. Uh, Mr. PKI, one of the most uh, frequent commenters here, says, uh, "Have you thought? <laughs> no, have you ever thought of creating an NFT for Sam's Report logo to sell it to make some serious coin?" Because um, I have some questions based on your commentary on crypto, blockchain, and NFTs. So I am not a fan of NFTs. I am not a fan of uh, what Ubisoft is going to be doing with here. I just, to me, they. <laughs> Phil Spencer appears to be in the same way. Uh, they. <laughs> they don't feel real and they don't feel and they're technically not tangible and they don't seem like the idea uh, of an nft in my opinion is it's like when you used to buy the ultimate halo infinite pack or whatever and you got it in a metal case well they're trying to replicate that sort of nostalgia but with an nft which is just an image with some potential trackability of when it was purchased and who purchased it i don't I, i'm not a fan of them in general um, crypto and blockchain is sort of a different conversation. Like the, uh, the concept of an open public ledger that is widely distributed to me is interesting. It is interesting. I don't know if as a currency replacement is the best use case for something like that. It may be, it may not be. I mean, crypto to me, like blockchain is the foundation. Crypto sits on top because crypto and blockchain to me are, are very closely related in, in how they operate. And so blockchain to me as a technology is very interesting. The idea and concept of crypto is also very interesting to me. I mean, just this past week, uh, crypto pricing was fluctuating with the Federal Reserve announcing interest rates, which, what does that mean? Well, that means that the crypto markets, at least a lot of the larger coins or whatever you want to call them at this point, are really just kind of like stocks because they're become a hedge against inflation potentially. Now, the problem is, is that crypto markets are crazy volatile compared to, say, buying gold. Typically, if interest rates going to go up, you can dump, dump some money into gold. But we also saw people dumping money into crypto as a potential separate hedge from inflation. So to me, it's just another economy. I, I, I still struggle a bit with the validity of it being a true currency in the name of, say, like a dollar. Uh, like, you know, you go to the store and you give them a dollar and then you get something. It might eventually get to that point. Right now, there's a lot of gas fees and other fees that really hurt that environment. Um, and and I, I don't want to just dump all over cryptos as being something that's not of value, but a lot of it... Uh, it is just potentially perceived value rather than tangible actual value. Now, I know someone's going to come in and say, but the dollar is the same thing. It's only potential perceived value. Yes, but there is a couple hundred years of history behind um, traditional currency. I know it's not technically gold backed at this point, but crypto, unlike a, a dollar, a dollar is based on a government's capacity to continue to operate. That's a really glossy look at it. 
Crypto, on the other hand, is not tied to that. So it's much more fluid. It's much more deregulated. Um, I look with uh, open eyes about where that market is headed, but I put NFTs like way over here, sort of in the gutter and cri crypto in the middle and then blockchain over here, like on there. That's really neat. Let's see where that goes. Crypto is, I'm still a little up and down uh, on some, mostly because there's like crypto coins popping up all over the place. And a lot of them were scams. A lot of them pop up in there. You know, I'm not talking BTC. I'm not talking Ethereum. I'm talking like, like, uh, I don't know. Here's your iPhone coin or whatever. Those sort of things do not sit well with me in the slightest. That was a really long answer to that stuff. Uh, Sydney2k says, happy six shopping days before Christmas, Brad. It is, and I've still got to get my wife something. Uh, here's a fun one. If the introduction of Windows 11 followed what happened with Halo Infinite, how do you think it might have been reported? Uh, woo. That is, a, if the introduction of Windows 11 followed what happened with Halo Infinite, how do you think that might have been reported? I don't, honestly, this question, I don't quite follow it. Uh, if you mean if Windows 11 launched after Halo Infinite, or if it was delayed a year, and then all of a sudden we got Halo Infinite. Um, I honestly, this is one of the few questions I don't, I don't quite have an answer because I don't quite follow. Um, oh, how do you think you might have reported? But I still don't understand because Windows 11 launched um, in an OKE-ish state. I mean, that's why I left doing pure media. I'm still doing a lot of media uh, to work on a company that augments Windows 11's functional and capabilities at Stardock because of what I saw that was coming down the pipe and the potential opportunity to uh, build. We've, we've got some fun stuff coming, um, coming down the pipeline. So I don't know uh, if Windows 11, would, there's no way Windows 11 could have launched in December. It, like it, from that perspective, there's not enough time from that happening to when PCs need to be on store shelves. And so there you go. Uh, Paul Gathara says, uh, do you think the most Microsoft will ever be cro cross-platform with Android is your phone or will they start making several apps cross platform with Android? Like let's say they come out with a redesign of OneNote and hopefully ditch that name. I don't know if they ditch that name. That name is, will it sync with Android? Microsoft syncing mechanism right now that they really like to push is OneDrive. That is where they like to sync things across uh, when possible because it's already established. It's already built. You save a file into OneDrive and it just pulls from a common repository uh, is how they like to do that stuff. I think your phone is probably about as deep as they get and let's be clear, though, that your phone stuff is pretty dang deep. I mean, you can replicate what's going on there uh, over to your device. And further, one thing we got to keep an eye on are Android apps on Windows 11, right? Google has announced they're bringing games, the Android games, to Windows 11. Microsoft has announced that they've it's already here in some capacity that you can run Android apps now through Amazon. And so... Um, I don't think we've seen the end of the integration with Android just because of your phone is there and then we have these Android apps, but Microsoft has definitely made a pretty significant investment in getting these things closer together. QNOC says, uh, Microsoft has been gathering a lot of bad press uh, with their choices regarding Microsoft Edge, like trying to stop people from downloading Chrome, blocking Edge deflector and protocol redirections, making it harder to switch browsers. And the list goes on and on. What do you think the reason is for enfor forcing Edge this aggressively? Well, Microsoft is fully aware that the browser is the future sort of work hub. It's the future everything hub. I mean, you could probably make that argument even today. Like, think about how when you use a computer, what do you have open 99.9% .9 of the time? It's a browser. Microsoft cannot lose this space. That's why they made the bold choice to just dump their old engine. Like, look, we're not going to be able to compete with that. We have to We have to embrace Chromium if we even want to stand a chance. And so the reason why they're doing this is that they, are, they lost so much market share from Internet Explorer uh, over the years that they have to claw it back. And how are they going to claw it back? Well, they got to do it aggressively. And that is why they are doing this. Now... They got to be careful, though, because this is what got them in trouble last time, being in a dominant position to dominate certain aspects of the market. Now, the, the browser market has changed dramatically since then. Chrome is the top dog. There's tons of competition. It's not like Microsoft is actively blocking other products from entering the market or restricting their capabilities. Chrome is eating... Chrome really hurt Microsoft. And so they're doing everything they can to at least try to balance that back again. And they're also trying to do, keep in mind, in a position where Google doesn't have the best optics on them either, right? They have issues with regulatory concerns. They have issues with just kind of being scary, if that makes sense, right? Uh, just because of all the data and everything else going on. And so Microsoft is taking advantage of that opportunity, but they got to be careful because this is what got them nailed last time. And so far, they've been able to stay out of the regulatory light 
but they're tiptoeing that water in my opinion. Uh, anything you, NGC224 says, anything you can say about the next Surface announcement? Uh, well, no, I don't want to say anything yet because it's still a little speculatory about what the processors are going to be from, um, uh, yeah. So just give me a couple weeks on that one. So there you go, guys. Uh, that wraps it up for this week. Next week, I'm going to do my annual what I use video because I'm not expecting much. And Friday is a holiday for probably massive amounts of people. So there's not going to be much going on uh, next week. So I will do the what I use wrap up end of year video. And uh, that's about all I got, guys. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and we'll catch all of you right back here next time.